Greetings, non-Western art appreciation class. I hope you're doing fantastically well. Today, as you can see, I'm at the Taj Mahal in India, one of the world's great Muslim monuments from the Mughal Empire, which we'll be talking about later on, and generally considered one of the seven wonders of the world today. And really, the hallmark image that shows up in India, which is ironically because India is 91% Hindu, and yet they were taken over for particularly the northern half of India for a number of years, a couple hundred years by the Mughal Empire, and established the greatest gift potentially to love ever that um, Shah Jahan made for his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. And that's where we get the name, the Taj Mahal. Today we're going to be talking about Islam. And as you probably already know, and as what you've seen from your readings and, and various things that we've talked about already, is that Islam basically means submission to Allah's will. Why study Islam? Well, there's some important reasons for us today as we go through within the process here. One is that Islam, with the idea of climate change, many, 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 many millions and billions of uh, Muslims live actually in the Middle East and in different parts of Asia that are undergoing rapid climatic change where we do expect that the places where they currently live might not be inhabitable in 50 years if the projections are accurate in terms of how water resources, they're gonna dry out and they're going to get hotter. That means those individuals are going to have to immigrate somewhere far, um, either north or south, most likely into Europe where there is water supplies, where there are good stable jobs, good stable governments that show up. And this is a huge problem because people are very worried about the, the cultural bridge and the cultural divide that comes with Islam versus the West. So we actually see down here before in Islam versus democracy. Um, India is already experiencing this where they're making pro or anti-Islam um, laws that basically have caused riots in our world's largest democracy, which is in India. Um, and so this is a, a, a hotbed of topic. Brexit with Britain leaving the European Economic Union is also based upon the entire idea of Britain said we want to keep Britons for the Brits. They were specifically talking about immigrants, specifically Muslim immigrants coming from different parts of the world. Remember, we in the United States went over and with the entire coalition, we destabilized the entire region, whether you thought it was right or wrong, when we actually basically um, took out Saddam Hussein in Iraq, the entire system and kind of the checks and balances that were there, which was already unstable, became even more unstable. And so this climate change and immigration, we expect there's about 50 million more immigrants that will have to move from this area of the world. And where would they go and what cultural conflicts may emerge, what racist conflicts may emerge coming out of this kind of capacity as well. As we still have a hydrocarbon-based fossil fuel economy, a lot of the world's oil is actually controlled in the Middle East, specifically by um, Muslim regimes. And so one of the things that shows up is, um, as long as we have a fossil fuel-based economy, we're going to be funding um, countries that are Muslim within the process. And so funding those nations, particularly if there is a battle going on between Islam versus democracy, the question is, is there a battle going on? There is possibility, is, isn't it possible to have a Muslim democracy? That's what Indonesia and Pakistan are currently trying, or at least within the idea of a republic like the United States, where you have representative democracy. We always fear this idea of terrorism, and yet terrorism from the Muslim world is actually very, very rare. It happens, we cover it, so we don't want to deny that at all, but you are looking at a fraction of a percent. We are talking about a population, um, when we look at Islam, of about 1.6 billion people, 27 to 28% of the world's population, and they are growing. And think about the number of terrorist attacks you hear in a weekly basis. Maybe one, maybe two, at 1.6 billion. It's about the same number of mass shootings that we hear about in the United States. And then roughly within that process, we generally have one to two, um, you know, we're looking at one to two individuals in a population of 320 middle, million. The situations are roughly equivalent. So we do need to deal with it and consider this, but we do need to take about, look at it from a larger perspective. In the United States, you are more likely to be killed by being struck by lightning than you are um, a foreign terrorist attack. It, it's just, it's very rare within the process. You're more likely to win the lottery than you are being killed by a terrorist attack. They have the second largest Islam itself with all the different nations. Um, this is both Sunni and Shia. 
the second largest population on Earth at 1.6 billion, making up 27 to 28 percent of the world population. And that is also the second largest religion in the United States today. They passed Judaism a number of years ago. So it goes the Christian faiths and sects and then followed by Islam. And Islam is actually growing in the United States of America, um, largely in prison populations and within African-American populations. Now, when we look at the percent of the population that is Muslim around the world, you'll know Islam has a foothold almost everywhere in the world, the same way that Christianity almost has a foothold everywhere in the world. If you look at the darker the green, the more likely it is, or the, the higher percentage of those individuals that are practicing some sect um, of Islam, whether it's Sunni or Shia in most, you'll note half of Africa basically, um, and that number is growing in Africa, is actually growing southward slowly. But here, here even in the United States, you're looking at Islam making up roughly about 8%. We're nearing about 10% of the population as it grows. So that's something that we should actually um, think of. Canada is the same way, Mexico. So we do see Islam spreading all over the world. It's one of the world's great religions. Now, let me give you an overview of Islam in 10 minutes. And here's the, is the overview I can show you. Hi there, I'm John Green. Thank you. I love those um, John Green videos. If you've never seen him before, he's actually the writer of Fault in Our, Fault in Our Stars um, and does these kind of great crash course videos. If you ever have a class or ever have an interest in a particular period of history, he might go into a little bit more depth than you want. But what he does is he puts very nice kind of spins on how the world actually emerged from not just one culture, but how they overlap with one another. As he said, the foundations of Islam, if you don't know, they're up here for a longer stint to take a look at. They are the Shahada, the Salah, the Zakat, the Hajj, and the fasting. So let's start off with. The first thing that all Muslims have to do is pronounce the Shahada, and that's the testimony. Basically, it's say that there is um, only one God, Allah, and uh, Muhammad is his final messenger, is the, is the prophet. He's the one who actually got it right. And so basically, we get the idea that the Quran itself is the word of God. It's not assimilated like the Torah. It's not assimilated and put together later on after Jesus' death, like the New Testament. It literally is the word of God that Muhammad himself received from a, a cave outside of uh, Mecca when he was there. Salah, it's the idea that five times a day you kneel down, then you pray towards Mecca rather than towards Jerusalem. You head towards Mecca, and specifically the Kaaba, which we'll show you in a moment. Zakat is the idea that you pay, uh, it's helping the poor. It's giving alms to charity. All Muslims who can afford it are supposed to do that. The Hajj, going on this pilgrimage between Mecca and Medina, just like the Prophet Muhammad did. And there's particular stations that you do um, during the month of um, Hajj or Dul Hajj, uh, go visit the House of Allah at the Kaaba. And you are required to do this if you can afford it and also if you are wealthy enough or, or also if you are healthy enough. Um, this poses a problem for us. Saudi Arabia today because Saudi Arabia and the town of Mecca is actually not in, in enormous, and neither is Medina, these enormous centers. So the population more than doubles during the Dul Hajj and they have to take a lot of precautions because it's very hot that people actually don't get sick, pass out, heat exhaustion, particularly for the elderly. And finally, fasting. During the month of Ramadan, you're supposed to fast early in the morning um, from sunup to sundown. Now, this is the Kaaba. Here you can see it being surrounded with these people circumambulating, basically walking around it. This is considered the first building that um, is basically made into a mosque or made into the version of a mosque. And so when the Prophet Muhammad is forced out of Mecca, this is the building in the central kind of square and market where people are selling their wares, but also where they worship all of those gods. So it's multifaceted. When he comes back, he makes it monotheistic and that's in 632 CE. So he's gone for about 10 years. To understand what the Hajj looks like, many Muslims say that the greatest experience in their life was actually doing the Hajj because they never feel a sense of oneness with God and with others. Just look at just how everyone is in unison during the prayers. And only Muslims are supposed to go here. So this would be on my very short list, but I am an atheist, so that becomes a problem. I have to petition the Saudi Arabian government if I officially legally ever want to go see this building, and I would clearly have to do it in South, outside of Dol Haas. Oh, 
but really is a remarkable building. It was believed to be built by Abraham and Isaac. Um, and so the individuals that actually formed the foundation of the Old Testament for Jewish and Christian is also the idea here. So there's a guide to the Hajj as well. So for Muslims, Hajj is the fifth and final pillar of Islam. And you will know, you start off in, in Mecca or Mecca in front of the Kaaba with the Grand Mosque. So this is where you begin. You circle the Kaaba seven times, a holy number in Islam. Then you actually continue on and you walk to Mina. Generally, you stop and you pray at Mina and you actually do some reading of the Quran, depending on how long you have to stop for. From here, you're going to do a giant loop that shows up. You're going to go to three. Prayer from noon to dusk in the Arafat Valley. That's where the prophet Muhammad preached his last sermon. And so you, there is actually a monument that you go and do. Then you come back to Muzdalif, and that's a pilgrim pick up the 49 rocks needed for the following day in Mina. You're going to use these 49 rocks then to throw out and kind of fight the devil off um, as you get back here. And then you continue on to Mecca. And again, you circle the Kaaba seven more times, hoping to get close enough to touch a particular rock that I will show you that Muhammad himself is believed to place on the Kaaba um, that was an asteroid. Now, the, because the Quran itself, two different spellings, Quran or Quran, basically that word means recitation. It is the most recited and most learned of any verses or of any book in world history. Um, Muslims, and I should mention, the Quran is only correct if it is specifically in um, Arabic. And so if you read the Quran in English, technically it's only a, a translation of the Quran. So almost all Muslims speak some Arabic or at least can recite some Arabic because they want to recite pieces of the Quran, their holy language, um, and also kind of about the holiness that shows up with the poetic verses that show up. It's written like a poem, more than like a narrative story like we have in the Bible. Children very early will start reading the Quran. It will be the first book that many Muslims will start to read, or one of the first books. They will hear the stories, just like in the Christian world or the Jewish world, they'll hear the stories. When before you actually touch your Quran, you're actually supposed to wash and clean yourself the same way as if you were going into a mosque or in the Christian world going into a church or the temple um, in Jewish tradition. And so it's so important that later on there's even Quran graveyards because it's considered to be the word of God. You can't just get rid of the Quran. The Quran is generally wrapped in this beautiful piece of cloth um, to protect it, keep the dust off while you're protecting the word of God. The opening surah, a chapter of the Quran, when we translate it over into English, looks like this. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise be to God, Lord of the universe, the compassionate, the merciful. Sovereign of the day of judgment. You alone we worship, and to you alone we turn for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not of those who have incurred your wrath, nor of those who have gone astray. So it literally is about the idea of merciful. Note the sovereign day of judgment. It's very similar because it's part of the Abrahamic faith along with Christianity and Judaism. It has many of the same tenets that show up. The major difference that shows up is that uh, Muslims believe that the Jews got the message of God wrong because they started worshiping the icons like the bull. And so they that's why we, we have so little um, iconic artwork or representational artwork, because that's one reason that the Jews got waylaid, at least according to the, the Muslim teachings. Um, the Muslims believe that the Christians got it wrong, believing that Jesus himself is the son of the divine savior um, of all. And Muslims said that's not true. He's not really um, the aspect. It's not a son of God. It's not the savior. He literally is another prophet in a long line of prophets because Jesus is a virgin birth, even in the Quran. So he is a prophet and a special wisdom individual. Um, the golden sermon or the, the, the great sermon on the Mount actually appears in a variation in the Quran. And they share the same stories. The stories are just interpreted differently. So for example, in the Quran, the Torah from the Jewish population and the Bible from the Christian population, all of them have the story of Noah. All of them, Noah, the great wave, the two by two animals, they tell different stories. In the Jewish and the Christian form, it's about God being so angered with all the violence and wrath and sin that was going on. He sent down this beautiful waterfall to kind of wipe out the population so they can begin a non-sinful world again. 
Islam sees that part of it, but they also see every, the people that go on the boat, they are not all the family members of Noah or Noah. They don't actually all get a spot on the, on the raft or on the great ark. And that is because for Muslims, the only people that are your true family members are people that are a member of the community, that are people that are a member of the ummah. So if your son decides to renounce Islam, he's no longer really a member. He's still your son, biologically and all that, but he's no longer a member of the community. And so therefore, the community trumps family within Islam. And we see that in a number of different surah or chapters. Surah is the word for chapter in the Quran. Now here's Muslim prayer explained. So the first step of the prayer is we raise our hands like this, and it's in a way pulling back the entire world and putting it behind us and entering into a new state. And we say Allahu Akbar, which means God is greater than all of this world and what's in it. And in those five to 10 minutes of prayer, we try to focus as much as we can just on God. And it's hard, but it's a practice we do five times a day. And so the steps of the prayer are as follows. The first step is standing up. And in this state, our mind is above our heart. And this symbolizes the first step of the journey for a seeker, uh, seeker of the truth. The first step is it's, it's all intellectual, learning at the steps how to purify oneself, how to pray. They learn the intellectual steps. The second step of the prayer is when we enter into the state of Raku, which is the bowing state. And in the state of Raku, in, in the bowing state, you, you will see my mind and my heart are aligned. And this, this state is we call the state of faith. And it's the second stage of the seeker. They enter into this state once they've learned the practice. And it's transferred from their mind to their heart. The final step is the sujood, the prostration, where, where we place our face below our mind, below our heart. And in this state, when we place our heart above our mind, it's a state of complete submission, which is what Islam means. It's a submission of our heart to God and trusting that whatever happens in our life, whatever hardships happen, that we trust God and that we're we're loving of God, whether the times are tough or the times are prosperous. So we thank Him in both in both situations. That's that's the prayer. So I think it's nice to have a, a Muslim's perspective on actually what prayer means. Remember, we have the idea, and all those traditions that actually come out of prayer actually come out of India anyway. Um, coming out of the Bhagavad Gita, one of the teachings um, that deals with the idea of prayer and meditation and really paying attention to God and centering your mind. That is actually a, a Hindu religious tradition then that these other religious traditions, Christian, Islam, um, Judaism, that they're all going to use, particularly in the monotheistic religion. Now, women in early religion, we often talk about gender equality and gender mismatch, and specifically talk about that within Islam specifically, but if we actually look and make some of the change challenges, we'll see that this is actually pan kind of human cultures, pan monotheism. So in the Quran, a couple things that show up. What it says is, it says from chapter and surah, um, men are in charge of women, comma, because Allah hath made the one of them to protect the other, because they spend of their property to the support of women. Men are supposed to take care of women. Now, we can argue this sexist in the modern day world. I will tell you in 632 CE, this is a watershed moment forward in terms of men taking care of women and being required by God in order to be good, healthy subjects. This is something that just is not happening in the rest of the world where it's mandated within a religion. So while we think in some way, all right, well, women have equality or maybe women should have more equality today because men are supposed to take care of them and men inherit more than women often in many Muslim countries. The reason why is because men are supposed to take care of women financially because men were the businessmen within the process as set up. It's really almost impossible to imagine a world where, you know, in 632 that the prophet Muhammad would think about in 2000, men and women are going to be equal and men and women are going to make the same amount of money. That's an unheard of proposition. Just the same way when we talk about the Jesus um, and the images that is that the Bible, even in the New Testament, allows for slavery. The idea that there would be no slaves um, in a thousand years was not even a fathomable uh, understanding within the Christian world. It had never existed before. So they're not even contemplating these things. So good women then, as you'll see in the Quran, 
Good women then are obedient, guarding in secret that which hath Allah hath um, guarded. As for those who you fear of the rebellion, admonish them and banish them to beds apart as punishment. No, if you are going to punish the woman, you should send her to a different bed. So it doesn't talk right here about the idea um, of, of beating. It doesn't talk about the idea of you know, stoning to death, that's all going to be patriarchal systems that are put on it. Here, the punishment is just don't sleep with them. Like that is the punishment for the female, you know, don't give them love on that particular night. And then of course, the, all the prayers end with Allah is ever high, exalted in grace. When we look at the Corinthians also within the biblical canon, you see the consequences of even women speaking in church, just to show you that in the Christian faith, we had the same issues. This is the time period where this all comes out. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. And it's one of the reasons why most Roman Catholic churches do not allow women priests today, female priests. They can be nuns, but they're not supposed to be the speakers that are actually within the church, particularly in ideas of the interpretation of the law. So this is something we've got to consider when we look at it. So we've got to separate as much as we can Islam from the patriarchal system and know the two come together in almost any culture. Just like it's hard to separate Christianity from the patriarchal system we have in the United States. And we are trying to work on it with separation of church and state, but we have still run into some, some problems as well. Now, as we look at these different things, the real question here is that do women choose to wear these in terms of socialization and what they believe, or are they forced to wear it? And that really becomes the difference. And so we have the niqab, the hijab, you can see the difference here. The burqa, this is really what um, uh, the Taliban forced Afghani women to wear when they were not allowed to go to, um, uh, to school, and they really would have to cover everything up. The chidor, jachod, uh, the chidor sorry, the chidor and the dupatta. And so it kind of depends on how women want to cover themselves as they go out in public. Now, the world of hijab, and here's really the right question to ask. When we talk about female rights, when is it required and when is it strongly admonished within the process that women really don't have a choice on, on how to wear or where to wear? From a Western perspective, that really should be our issue much more than it. all women. It's definitely not all women. It's not even most women. But there is world of hijab. There are laws and legal restrictions, like the red ones, on what women can wear in particular areas. And note, what is interesting is that some of them are European nations as well. France, which supposedly has freedom of religion, has now said that a woman cannot, or a girl, um, cannot wear the hijab when she goes to school. The United States, we would never make this law, right? That is anti-separation of church and state, but Germany has actually made the same law. So we have individuals that are on some level anti-Islam, even within countries that we would say are openness within the Western world to this freedom of religion, this freedom of expression. So we gotta be careful when we actually lump them all together. So these are legal restrictions that show up. If it's mandatory, it's obliged by law. By law. Note the dark green, that's Saudi Arabia in particular, the two largest ones, and the other one is Iran. There are requirements that women have to wear a particular dress, otherwise be arrested. Um, or and pay fines in many cases. In some cases, it's a jail sentence. And then where it's prevalent, which is really kind of forced within a group, but not necessarily required, but you would literally stand out. And so we see Afghanistan here where the Taliban um, was able to take hold about 20 years ago, all the way across from North Africa. And that's what we're looking at. Those are the, the nations that we should be looking at as a human rights abuse if women really don't have the option of, of doing practicing what they want. Now, there are women, and so there's an Iranian exile artist named Artist, and her name is um, Shireen Nashat. She lived from 1957. She's still alive today. But she basically says this. She says, the West assumes that Muslim women are passively accepting male patriarchy. And she said, nothing could be further from the truth. Just because we don't see it, it's not really part of the story and the narrative we're used to, right? We're used to promoting the idea of patriarchy within the process. So there's plenty of women that are pushing the bounds and that are challenging it. Now, they are arrested, they are harassed, like many people who push the bounds. I mean, look at Dr. Martin Luther King during our civil rights movement. Look at the leaders of the Stonewall 
um, riots or the Stonewall, depending on which side you're on, the Stonewall riots uh, for the LGBTQ community in New York City in the late 1960s, 1970s. Those individuals were arrested um, for indecency, and yet they were still pushing the boundary because they were right. It was the just cause. And that's what many women in the Muslim world are doing today. One so much, this is an Arab American female photographer, note that shows nudity, which is almost unheard of in most parts of the Muslim world. She challenges the stereotypical image of Muslim women of being, by looking at North African facial tattoos, rather than showing with all the burqas, they're showing, look at all the different options that are out there depending upon where you are in the Muslim world. Silent sirens, women literally performing these kind of dances that show up, and then women trying to challenge the idea of women at a harem that we see that it really is a willingly, not a forced kind of choice that shows up. Now, this image I am always controversial and always wary of putting up because without me being there in person, I wanna make sure that we get this right. So the controversy here is that this is fake news. Islam in the Western mass media and terrorism. So here's what the mass media often talks about in terms of three types of jihad. They are not the accurate types of jihad that I'll show you in a moment. But I wanna give you an idea so you have an idea how we challenge this. One is that yeah, there's a religious jihad, which is kill non-Muslims like Christians, Hindus, Jews, and Buddhists, behead those who can't recite the Quran, stone pelting on the army, bomb blasts, population jihad, kill the educated and rich Muslims, also have eight to 10 children, and the intellectual jihad, pretend you're a secular play victim, talk unity, blame to Israel and the United States. No, this is jihad for dummies by Obama. Like this is a racist image that shows up that's often used in popular media, particularly more conservative ones. When you look at it, there are jihads. And so we need to talk about what the truth behind a jihad really is. So jihad for educated Americans or citizens, and I am a consultant to the United Nations, we deal with this within the process. Two types of jihad that there are, referred to as the sixth pillar of Islam sometimes. There is an eternal religious jihad, and there's an external military jihad. The internal religious jihad means it's strive, and jihad actually means strive or struggle in the way of Allah. And so an internal jihad is this. It's when you're striving to lead a good Muslim life, praying and fasting regularly, being attentive spouse and parent, or working hard to spread the message of Islam. It's within your right to actually call out other Muslims when no other one else besides other Muslims are there to actually say, hey, this is not right. This is not something you should do. This is not the right way of doing it. No. It's not violent, but it is confrontational and can be confrontational because what you're trying to do is actually raise other individuals to be better Muslims within your society. So you have a better Muslim society or a better Muslim Ummah community that shows up. And there is an external military jihad. So we've got to be very careful about that. And the external military jihad is the idea aggressive action can be taken. So we have a defense of Islam an aggressive military action allow, uh, allowed, particularly if individuals are coming and starting to challenge what the basic fundamental tents of Islam are. They do allow the, uh, the killing of non-military targets is never allowed according to strict Islam. So these terrorists who are blowing up individuals that are non-military targets, women at the marketplace, or 9-11 because it's a non-military target, that is never allowed, never allowed. Now, one of the challenges for us is this. Islam has no centralized religious scholars, so heretics can lead the faithful astray. So you could have a, have a renegade individual that is seen as a leader by certain individuals that has a different interpretation of the Quran um, and of the, the, the jihad come up and say, according to my understanding, or this is what this particular verse means, and then actually go into what that verse means, and try to convert people to more radical military action, even against civilians. Note, that is not covered by Islam. The same way that when we have uh, an American who kills an abortion doctor, um, you know, shoots an abortion doctor, that is not condoned by Christianity. It never has been condoned by Christianity. The same is true of Islam when we have this, this aspect. The difference in Christianity is generally there's a hierarchy. There's other Christians who can sit up and say, you can't do that. That's awful. That person is not Christian. That person is not devout. Note in Islam, we don't have that hierarchy. Islam has no central religious scholars. And you're not supposed to overhear 
critique individuals from an eternal jihad. So people are like, well, why didn't they speak up against 9-11? Well, they're only supposed to speak up in terms of that aspect and say, you know, their, their apologies or their sympathies or that this is not Islamic only if there's other Muslims that actually happen to be in the room. And so it's a catch-22. We want Muslims to stay up for jihad, big J, jihad versus little J, jihad. And yet when they don't, we complain, but it's not within their faith. It will be the similar idea of, you know, and Christians don't have this. We call Christians out all the time. It's never written, never thought of, never in the Hadith that you're not supposed to critique someone that's in your ummah or in your faith. We don't have that in Christianity or Islam or Christianity or Judaism. They have that in Islam. So when we look at the comparison of the religious beliefs, they're radically, radically the same, as I mentioned before. Judaism, we have the idea, Christianity, Islam, they're all, all monotheistic. Name of God, Yahweh, the Holy Trinity, and Allah. The character of God, non-physical, non-gender, non-physical, you know, male in this capacity, non-physical, non-gender in Islam. Human nature, two equal impulses, original sin, look at Islam. We are innate, innately good, which is different than both. It's very progressive for its time period, and we're equal ability to do good or evil. But God believes in Allah, and Islam believes we're inherently good to begin with. The means of salvation is correct belief, correct belief, correct belief. And this is good deeds and faith in Allah himself. Now, the early history of Islam, which John Green actually talked about in the history of Islam, is this. During the holy month of Ramadan in 610 CE, a merchant named Muhammad sought solitude in a cave in Mecca, Arabia, now Saudi Arabia. The angel Gabriel, the same angel Gabriel that announced the um, Virgin Mary in Christianity, um, that the Virgin Mary was going to get pregnant with the Christ child, the same angel Gabriel appeared and commanded him to recite the revelations of Allah. Really, he was reciting Allah's word at that point. In that moment, Muhammad became the messenger of Allah. And these revelations then formed the basis of Islam. So it really is God's word, very different than Christianity and or Christianity and Islam, right? Which are humans recounting stories of what they heard and maybe of what they experienced with Jesus many, many generations afterwards. Muhammad's flight from Mecca to Medina, Madama taught about equality rather than patriarchy, which was unheard of in 632, as I mentioned. And it really did upset the male establishment. Muhammad also preached the idea of monotheism and the Quraysh, his tribe, controlled the export trades of all the different gods. And so that really did kind of challenge the economic system that was set up. So Muhammad's success in creating a community of believers made him unwelcome in his own homeland of Mecca. And he actually was run out of town in 622. This is actually called the Hajira, from Mecca to Medina. And in 632, he had raised enough of an army and followers 10,000 troops returned back to Mecca, and they established the first multi-religious society and constitution that we have in the early history of humanity. The earlier Kaaba here, believed to be built by Abraham and Isaac themselves, Ishmael, or Ibrahim and Ishmael, was established as the first mosque. So that's what we're looking at. When Muhammad dies, there's a power struggle. That power struggle leads to the foundation of the Sunni and Shia, depending on who you believe should be the rightful heir in the aftermath of the prophet's death, who was handpicked by Allah. No one was handpicked um, afterwards. The Sunnis believed it should be someone, the Shias believed it should be someone else. So the Sunnis selected Abu Bakr, while Shias insisted that Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, Ali ibn Ibi Talib, was his designated successor. And this caused the rift, even though the fourth successor for Muhammad ends up being the son-in-law anyway. It still caused the rift. And that's why we have Islamic sects today. Just like in Christianity, we have different sects, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Methodist Southern, um, Southern Baptist, um, Roman Catholic. And so here today, you can actually see the layout of where Sunni and Shia, the different sects are. The green and bluish color are in the Sunni and they are dominant. Right? They make up almost 85% of Muslim populations. The Shia make up roughly the other 15%. And the only other one is the Abadi, which is slightly different off here, right off the coast of Arabia. Now, the Kaaba, which refers to the cube, or translates as the cube, in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, 
It's the most holy spot in Islam. And it's the original temple created by Abraham and Isaac, as I mentioned before. It was converted to the first mosque by Muhammad when he comes back in 632 CE. And this is the area, the thing that all Muslims pray to, they face this monument. So all Muslims at any given point of day, and this makes it interesting, they're in Asia, they actually pray, um, and you know, in farther parts of Asia, they're praying and looking west. If they are in the United States of America, um, Muslims actually pray and face east. If they're in Africa and Southern, they're actually looking much more north within the process. So they all look at this one spot, this very holy spot that was sacred to Muhammad. Now, every year, right before the Hajj, the lovely Kaaba, which you can actually see here, it's a stone and brick building. It has actually has a kiswa, a drape, that actually gets changed, and they will periodically change the color. On the outside is the bismeli, and that is the idea and the writings from the Quran itself, particularly the opening of the Quran, the first surah. Inside the Kaaba, then you can actually see from this cutaway, this is the original inside of the Kaaba. It hasn't been updated that much, um, and it really held multiple different images, and also has got a basin for water for purification rituals. Creating the Kiswa, the drape around the Kaaba, here is actually one of the statements that's all, always on that Kiswa. O oh Allah, there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Remember, that's very close to the testimony, the Shahada. The most loving, the benefactor, glory be to Allah, and praise be to Allah, and glory is to Allah the Great. Even in a business meeting, the business meeting, if you've done a good presentation, it'll be praise be to Allah. Um, you'll actually say that afterwards. Or if you've had a very good meal, um, you'll actually use this as a reference, always thanking Allah. So it's very much a part of the daily life of individuals. And the black stone on the corner is a meteorite. It is called the Hajar al-Aswad, the holy black stone. It is believed that Muhammad himself placed it there, converting it from the ancient pagan temple for multi-gods to monotheistic Allah. It's originally believed to be white, but is nearing black today because of all the affection and all of the different sins that is actually absorbed. So Muslims that are actually on the Hajj in their seven circuits around try to get close enough that they can actually kiss and rub this particular meteorite. When we look at a mosque, then there are numerous different features that show up in a mosque. Now, not all of them are required. We'll talk about that. But a mosque generally has two minarets. These are towers, and those towers are often used where the individual can announce the call to prayer. There is generally a dome. Um, the, the dome comes from across the Silk Road from Roman culture, and, and it's the symbol of God and man coming together. The perfect shape of God, or of man, I should say, is the square. Perfect angles, 90 degrees, perfect shape of God, all knowing, all ending, no beginning, no end is the dome the circle. So bring those two together, but this is not required. Always a, a, a basic entrance that shows up. An ablution area, which is required. This is an area where you clean and purify yourself. Almost all religious buildings around the world, whether they're temples or um, mosques or um, churches, have areas where you wash your hands. And Muslims wash all the way up to the elbow and all the way up to the knee, hands and feet. So there's going to be a mirab. That is a little niche in the back. And the mirab is something that basically always faces towards Mecca. And there will always be a guide towards Mecca. Many people will actually even have a watch. I know on iPhones, there's an app that will always point you towards Mecca, will know exactly where you are, so you turn around. There's generally a Qibla wall in the back, and that actually, the Qibla faces Mecca direction, and the Mirab is the little niche inside of that Qibla wall. And the Minbar, also sometimes pronounced Minbar, M-I-N-B-A-R, that is a little platform where individuals can, can uh, preach from. And so here's, here's the Prophet's Minbar, where the Prophet's almost like a sermon stage, where he could pray on. There's generally an open area, but not required, is the sun or the courtyard. And there are generally open prayer carpets you can pray on, but you can also bring your own in terms of particularly for Friday prayers when it's very busy. Now, when we look at Islam, there are three spots that are the most holy without question. And they are going to be the Kaaba. This by far is the most holy um, image in all of Islam. The second most is going to be the Prophet's Mosque, 
when the prophet um, created his own mosque, his own area. This is actually the prophet's mosque in Mecca and Medina. And then the Dome of the Rock, the farthest mosque, this is actually one of the most sacred spots in all of the world for Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And we'll look at that why. So the Prophet's Mosque here, al Amasti al-Nabawi, that's in Medina, Saudi Arabia. So this is the second most important Muslim site after the Kaaba. And that is because when the Prophet Muhammad left for his hajira, was forced out in 622, he had to have a place to go. And so him and his followers, mostly his family members, settled in Medina. And this is where we started to preach the idea of monotheism and that he had received the word of God, the recitation of the Quran. And 10 years later, he had a population that was supporting him of about 10,000. That slowly has become the second most powerful mosque known for its green dome over the burial site of the Prophet Muhammad himself. So here's the inside. It's absolutely gorgeous laid out. You can see the prayer rugs all the way through, beautiful arches, it beautiful light and domes within it. The large sand, because it's so hot in this area, is decorated with these beautiful um, prayer hall, so kind of modern technology to make actually the experience much more um, pleasant and palatable. So rather than concentrate on the heat, you can really concentrate much more on God and his messenger, the prophet. The original shape and the original reconstruction of the prophet's mosque, this is what we thought it looked like. Here's today. Here's what it looked like when um, in 622 to 632, much smaller, but it's become such a pilgrimage site for the spots, just like larger Roman Catholic churches that have pilgrimage relics that thousands and millions of people go here, specifically during the Hajj. And so here is the tomb of the prophet himself. And they believe they have three hairs from the beard of the prophet, um, and they have other artifacts from the actual prophet's own body that you can go and be amazed by if you're a Muslim, that you are that close to the history of your religion. Now, elements of Islamic style architecture that developed from the Prophet Mosque that show up all over the world, even though they are not required, but generally used because they're paying homage to what we have here, that Prophet's Mosque himself. You're gonna have minarets or towers to call for prayer. Um, and so oftentimes you have minarets, large scale, so you can actually announce it through the entire city. There's a mirab prayer niche indicating Mecca. This is required. You're gonna have decorative calligraphy without haram. Haram means forbidden images. And so it's really gonna be about calligraphy. Remember the Muslims believe that the Jews made a mistake when they started worshiping the golden calf. Um, so they try to have an iconic artwork that I'll show you in a minute. That they often have bright colors, but not required really to stimulate the senses, right? Because that's a more pleasant way of prayer and getting activated towards the energy of God. There's generally a four Ewan plan, basically four different block areas. So that show up here. The use of geometric and repetitive shapes called arabesques, which are gonna show up all over the place and set and turn fountains generally for ablutions. The most important um, or the third most important and the most expensive piece of land on earth is actually this piece. And this is Temple Mount in Jerusalem in Israel. And that is because underneath this dome and the surrounding area, which is raised off in Jerusalem itself, is the sacred spot for about 60%, maybe even 70% of the world's population. Because this spot is sacred to Muslims, making up 28% of the world's population, Jews making up a fraction of a percent of a population today, and Christians making up 33% of the world's population. So basically they believe in this little spot here, those three religions, that this is Golgotha. This is the Adam and Even burial site that actually is supposed to be somewhere around here. This is the Dome of the Rock Church. That is the Abrahamic Faith's Rock. So that is where Abraham is basically, basically willing to sacrifice his son Isaac or Ibrahim and Ishmael in the Muslim tradition. And they believe the rock is actually underneath this dome right here that I'll show you in a moment. Al-Aqsa Mosque, the farthest mosque from Muhammad's night journey is right here next to it on the same, literally hundreds of feet from one another. The Christian Via de la Rosa, the Trail of Sorrow, supposedly where Christ carried his own cross to his crucifixion is right behind here. And the Jewish Wailing Wall is right over here where the former Ark of the Covenant of the temple, the great temple is, all on one spot within one square mile. Very controversial 
um, piece of land. And here it is on the outside. You'll note this today, even though it started off as a Christian church, later on during um, the Crusades, the Christians lost it. And so Muslims took over and actually added Muslim calligraphy from the Quran itself right on the decoration on the outside. So on the Dome of the Rock, if you go inside, you know it's a whole hollow area, except for right here, and that is the, the actual rock that they believe that Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac right here on Temple Mount. Here's the beautiful calligraphy on the outside of it. Beautiful decoration. No, you can have gorgeous decoration without having images. And that's what Muslim calligraphy is supposed to show. Now, Al-Aqsa, or also called the furthest mosque, Temple Mount on Jerusalem, this is the site of Muhammad's night journey. If you don't know, Muhammad rides a horse, the horse is named Barakh, to visit Allah and negotiate the number of prayers. Initially, Allah thought that everyone should pray to him, uh, all Muslims should pray to him 500 times a day. But of course, that would not give you enough time to do anything else if you're constantly praying. And so Muhammad himself, a note with the blank face here, because an iconic, we don't want you to worship him, um, actually flew up and basically negotiated with Allah that the people should only have time to pray for five times a day, and that would be sufficient. So the an iconic features of Muhammad's face. So it's narrated that Aisha, the wife of the prophet, here's what she says. I bought a cushion having on it pictures of animals. When Allah's apostle saw it, he stood at the door and did not enter. I noticed a sign of disapproval on his face that said, so this is from the Hadith, O oh, Allah's apostle, I repent to Allah and his apostle. What sin have I committed? She's not sure. Allah's apostle said, the makers of these pictures will be punished on the day of resurrection. And it will be said to them, give life to what you have created, these pictures. The prophet added, these angels of mercy do not enter a house in which there are pictures of animals. They were worried about worshiping him the same way the Jews began worshiping the golden calf. And so there's the idea that in Islam, we should have an iconic images. Now, not all Muslims believe this. If you go to India, there's a lot of icons, but they generally never show the prophet Muhammad. And if they do, they show the back of his head and the actions that he's doing. They generally don't show the prophet's wife, Aisha. They generally do not show Allah. And so they kind of cover those up. And so it comes out of this text from Exodus. Thou shalt make to thyself a grave, thou shalt not make to thyself a graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. So that graven image is really what we're looking at. And those who believe in statues are a crime, a sin originating in sin, in Satan. So that is actually from the Quran itself. So this prohibited most Muslims from depicting Allah and other figures in art, fearing that that actually was a statue or that was a painting, that was a crime originating in Satan because Satan was trying to lure us into worshiping other things, false gods. And that has actually caused the traditional switch between, and this is not a Sunnah, Sunni, Shia switch. This is what most Muslims believe. And so instead we get Islamic geometric patterns that look like this to decorate everything. In Islamic culture, geometry is everywhere. You can find it in mosques, madrasas, palaces, and private homes. This tradition began in the 8th century CE during the early history of Islam, when craftsmen took pre existing motifs from Roman and Persian cultures and developed them into new forms of visual expression. This period of history was a golden age of Islamic culture, during which many achievements of previous civilizations were preserved and further developed, resulting in fundamental advancements in scientific study and mathematics. Accompanying this was an increasingly sophisticated use of abstraction and complex geometry in Islamic art, from intricate floral motifs adorning carpets and textiles to patterns of tilework that seemed to repeat infinitely inspiring wonder and contemplation of eternal order. Despite the remarkable complexity of these designs, they can be created with just a compass to draw circles and a ruler to make lines within them. And from these simple tools emerges a kaleidoscopic multiplicity of patterns. 
So how does that work? Well, everything starts with a circle. The first major decision is, how will you divide it up? Most patterns split the circle into four, five, or six equal sections, and each division gives rise to distinctive patterns. There's an easy way to determine whether any pattern is based on fourfold, fivefold, or sixfold symmetry. Most contain stars surrounded by petal shapes. Counting the number of rays on a starburst, or the number of petals around it, tells us what category the pattern falls into. A star with six rays, or surrounded by six petals, belongs in the sixfold category. One with eight petals is part of the fourfold category, and so on. There's another secret ingredient in these designs, an underlying grid. Invisible but essential to every pattern, the grid helps determine the scale of the composition before work begins, keeps the pattern accurate, and facilitates the invention of incredible new patterns. Let's look at an example of how these elements come together. We'll start with a circle within a square and divide it into eight equal parts. We can then draw a pair of crisscrossing lines and overlay them with another two. These lines are called construction lines, and by choosing a set of their segments, we'll form the basis of our repeating pattern. Many different designs are possible from the same construction lines, just by picking different segments. And the full pattern finally emerges when we create a grid with many repetitions of this one tile in a process called tessellation. By choosing a different set of construction lines, we might have created this pattern or this one. The possibilities are virtually endless. We can follow the same steps to create six-fold patterns. By drawing construction lines over a circle divided into six parts and then tessellating it, we can make something like this. Here's another six-fold pattern that has appeared across the centuries and all over the Islamic world, including Marrakesh, Agra, Konya, and the Alhambra. Four-fold patterns fit in a square grid, and six-fold patterns in a hexagonal grid. Five-fold patterns, however, are more challenging to tessellate because pentagons don't neatly fill a surface. So instead of just creating a pattern in a pentagon, other shapes have to be added to make something that is repeatable, resulting in patterns that may seem confoundingly complex but are still relatively simple to create. Also, tessellation is not constrained to simple geometric shapes, as M. C. Escher's work demonstrates. And while the Islamic geometric design tradition doesn't tend to employ elements like fish and faces, it does sometimes make use of multiple shapes to craft complex patterns. This more than 1,000-year-old tradition has wielded basic geometry to produce works that are intricate, decorative, and pleasing to the eye. And these craftsmen prove just how much is possible with some artistic intuition, creativity, dedication, and a great compass and ruler. And so the notion here then is the creation, as we're looking at it, is based upon the idea of the divine. A repeating pattern that repeats over and over ad infinitum, no matter where you go, or in the circular shape that begins in the square, is the idea of the God um, and man coming together in the infinite divine, combining the best elements of both. And that's exactly what Islam wants us to do. One of the most famous mosques of all time that ever did this is the Suleiman Mosque, also known as the Blue Mosque, where it's beautiful blue tile here by Sinan the architect from 1550 to 1557. And you can just see the inside, now that we look at the tessellation, the entire dome and structure, it's gorgeous inside. Kind of all these are individual tires then, tiles, that you can actually look, some are four, some are six, and some are the, um, the eight-fold or six-fold base that show up. Later on, this is also going to be part of the Hindu Islam architectural features at the Taj Mahal in Agra when the Mughal Empire takes over. You'll note it's very much more similar to the Sinan architecture that's showing up all throughout the Turkish world and the Muslim world than it is the Hindu temple in the southern style, or even actually this one's in the northern style, which basically starts to emulate this. There are types of Muslim architecture using the same architectural design, but again, 
always facing towards Mecca. They always have that grand entrance way. They almost always have a place of, of washing up beforehand, whether that's Moorish in Spain, in India, the Mughal architecture, the Ottomans in Turkey, the Persians actually in Iran, Sino-Islamic kind of all over the world, um, kind of China, and Sahelian Islamic, um, this is in Mali. And so the great mosque at Jene in Mali has those same features, architectural features, but they also believe from the African perspective, it's got bodily family references. So the architect here had to actually combine both of these in order to create this architectural wonder. They've even started using stained glass. Why? Because it's not about kind of getting the uh, Zaha Hadid. She designed the London Aquatic Center, the Soho Beijing residencies, which were actually used a little bit for um, uh, the Olympic athletes when, during the Beijing. And in Miami, she created this 1000 museum residencies. So we actually have one here in Miami that you can actually go see. The other art form that we kind of need to know as we're talking about is garden carpets. And note, the aniconic, you'll still see images, but you'll have this geometric pattern that repeats, and occasionally you'll have animals that are buried within it. And one of the things that shows up is, note, you've got the giant kind of broken down. You've got a, a middle kind of fountain or area that shows open, a way to get in and out. And these are basically the garden carpets of paradise, trying to show you what is actually afterwards. And so they're spectacular, and they can fetch hundreds of thousands of dollars. Look at the beautiful guys, stitching. Gonna come to my They're going to walk to them. The country of Iran is synonymous with carpets. The art of carpet weaving in Persia originated more than 2,500 years ago. And today, Iran is the world's largest producer and exporter of carpets, and it's a huge part of their economy. I think it's safe to say that nobody does carpets better than Persians. This is the carpet from 100 years ago. It's done on prayer rug. Camel school and lamp school. For centuries, Persian carpets have been produced to decorate floors of buildings and provide nomadic people protection from cold winters. The techniques and designs for carpet weaving have been passed down for generations throughout periods of peace, invasion, and war. Look, we have board here, we have board here. We take one from front, one from the back, and we make a knot. There's always a variety because different ethnic groups in Iran produce different carpets. We have Ashkai, Lor, Deluj, Arab, Shah Savan. They have different kinds of carpet. All over Iran today, carpet making is the most popular handcraft, and you can see them displayed everywhere, on the floors and walls of all palaces, households, restaurants, hotel rooms, museums, and famous buildings. In Esfahan, where we are today, Persian carpets have been woven since the 16th century and are famous for their elaborate colors, distinct patterns, and artistic design. We headed into a famous carpet store called Iran Pazirik to learn about some of the best Persian rugs from a master named Majid. For many Persians, not only Majid, it is clear that carpet is their most treasured and valued possession. And speaking of value, these rugs are not cheap. 27,800 US dollars include the cheap. Just 15,000 US dollars. Carpet made from silk, wood, 250 pieces of 18 karat gold, pearl. Gold. These are all pearl from Persian gold, from fresh water. This is gold, 18 karat, 250 pieces, 70,000. Can I ask for the cheapest carpets and stuff? <laughs> I wanted to buy one, but the prices didn't exactly align with my budget, especially the pure silk and antique wool ones. 100% natural silk. How much is it? 100,000. 100 grand. What do you think, Ryan? I could buy a nice house for the price of one rug. Maybe someday, on my next trip to Iran, I'll get to bring one of these guys home. Thank you. Bye -bye. And so, within the other thing, the other art form that we actually can talk about, are these ideas of calligrams which are basically when you take verses from um, the Quran itself, such as the opening of the Quran, and you actually turn them into these beautiful images that overlay. And so it doesn't always have to be Quran. Here we see one done with classical music, but they're often kind of calligraphy is one of the primary art forms that we've seen all over mocks. They also show up in garden carpets. So calligraphy can actually show the idea and the message of what it actually is. My name is Taha. From the Quran itself. I'm an architect and an artist. People just sometimes think that when you do a calligraphy, you just sit down and write, like casual writing. And it's the exact opposite from that. It's actually a long process to create a letter of calligraphy. When letters were created as an art, 
they were based on the human body. The letter would have a chest, the letter would have a lower part of the body, the letter would have a, a neck. So you can see, for example, the L, uh, which is the first letter equivalent to the A in, in Latin. Uh, the alif in Arabic is exactly the human posture. It has the uh, chest and the spine, which is leaning slightly forward, and it has the head of the letter. The spine, or the backbone of Islam, is the Quran, which is the holy book. The Prophet realized that the importance of preserving the Quran in such a way that it cannot be altered or changed. All this richness of, of culture that started brewing under the Islamic pot produced calligraphy in its sophisticated form that we follow until today. We use very strong rules and very tight regulations. If you have a, sometimes if you have a pimple on your face, you can see it clearly because it's a bump. Although it's tiny in, in relation to the size of your body, but you see it, you notice it, and exactly the same way in letters, no matter how big or small they are. And that's what makes calligraphy very challenging, and sometimes people could call it as a labor-intensive art, because it takes a lot of hours into one sheet of paper. And the combinations of some letters with others are very hard. There are, there are names in Arabic, or words in Arabic, which are very hard to write. There are long words in Arabic, uh, which I'm, I was writing recently, and um, the problem with the word is that it's such a long word that it eats half of my, my composition. So half of my composition is eaten by one word, and I have seven other words to fit in. It's just like trying to get two people who don't get on, trying to get them to sit and talk. And sometimes it's very hard because each one snaps from a different angle. And, um, you have to, it's like diplomacy, you have to work them out. But at the end, the more experienced you are, the more diplomatic you become with letters, and the more your letters will actually speak back to you and accept to sit next to something they, they didn't want to sit next to. So I think that's the skill of the calligrapher. Mm -hmm. And Muslim calligraphy is actually one of the high points. And so three of the most important Muslim artworks, as we've actually talked about, are calligraphy, mosque architecture, and garden carpets, particularly um, when they actually demonstrate the bismillah, the opening of the Quran, um, God, the most, this is it, the most merciful, which is what both of these individuals say. We also see that on the outside of most mosques as well. There are different sty styles of calligraphy as well. Here we have the very geometric or the versus the more cursive style that actually shows up. So you can actually see how they become decorated. This is on the, the mirab, the curve, the Qibla wall. All right, in the modern day world then, one of the things that we talked about at the very beginning, why do we need to know this modern problems, Islam is facing a couple of different things. One, poverty in Islam. Islam, many different areas want to go back and live much more in the sixth century, the time of the prophet Muhammad or the seventh century, the prophet um, immediately after the prophet. And they really want to have a very conservative kind of version of Islam. The problem of course, is that they would not be involved and those individuals would not be involved in the modern day capitalist system or socialist or communist system for modern economies. And so poverty is a huge issue when we go back. It also means that education is going to be highly limited and only based upon the Quran, really rejecting science and things from the modern world, which poses all sorts of problems for those individuals, um, except that they would live a much more, what they would believe, time, life, um, very similar to the prophet himself. We have the idea of climate immigration that's taking place, the democracy versus Sharia. Can we have Sharia law? Now, remember, Sharia is the law of the, the Prophet and of the Hadith, but there are different Sharia laws depending upon where you live and how you want to interpret those laws. The same way that we are still fighting over the Constitution, and the Second Amendment, who has the right to carry guns, it's unclear actually within the Constitution. That's the challenge for all of us. There is a conservative and a liberal interpretation of it. We have the same thing with Sharia law. It's not just standardized law. Um, there's a number of different sh Sharia laws that can be kind of talked about in terms of what should be done both then and in the modern day world. We have a battle between Su Sunni and Shia and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a 
a foursome for a lot of the rest of the world because the United Nations set up Israel for a Jewish homeland and brought individuals in World War II, um, in the aftermath of World War II there and saying, all right, here's your homeland. But there were already Muslims, Palestinians living on that land that then were ousted and then were no longer the majority population. So we are still trying to figure out how do we have a two-state solution because we in the West kind of messed this up in the 1940s. The Jewish people clearly need a homeland, but the Palestinians need a homeland too. And how do we figure that kind of conflict out? We generally are supporting much more so on the Israeli side, the Jewish side for the Jewish Christian element. And of course that upsets much of the Muslim world. Remember the Muslim world make up 1.6 billion people, 28% of the world's population. Whereas the Jewish people here, they're fading. I mean, there really is only 16 million Jews on the entire planet, million. So they are a fraction of a percentage, 20 versus 28% of the world's population at 1.6 billion. And finally, and the challenge for all of us is this, about 250 years ago, we in the Western world went through our enlightenment period where we started to promote and think through the idea of rational thought and enlightenment and the idea of scientific discovery and the separation of church and state and the idea that reason and emotion and figuring out the differences. We went through a scientific and technological revolution and industrial revolution. Islam right now is going through and trying to figure out on the conservative side versus the liberal side of Islam, both in Sunni and Shia, which side they're going basically through their enlightenment now. And so the idea is, will they come out the side of science and modern globalization and peace and prosperity, or they really want to go back and live in a, an era where they not necessarily deny, but they avoid those particular issues and live really how the prophet lived well back into the sixth and or seventh, eighth and ninth centuries and go and kind of revert back to it, which is a much less kind of globalized world, but also a much less human rights based world because in the sixth century or in the seventh century, Islam was very at the cutting through edge, as I said, of human rights. But by today's standard, we now live 1,400 years later. We've come a long way in human rights and reinterpreting and thinking about equality and the rights of men and women and LGBTQQQ, queer questioning mark community. And Islam is actually trying to figure out what do we do with those two different things. Now, it very well might be that different countries come up with different solutions, and that is happening currently. That's why we saw the Taliban take over Afghanistan and put on a really repressive regime for the modern day world. We see the same thing in Iran, actually, that's slowly happening, even after they had a democracy in the 1950s, which has kind of faltered. And sadly, it was the United States that actually pushed them to falter a little bit. So different parts of Islam are going through this, and it's really hard as an outside Western world to watch this, because we don't know what side is actually going to come out. Is it going to be the more global modernist Indonesian model, um, Pakistani model with a constitution and based upon the rights? Or is it going to be more the Taliban model, depending upon where we are looking at in different parts of the Muslim world? And that's not for us to decide. We kind of have to hang on because Islam's probably in for a bumpy road. The Enlightenment was a bumpy period. I mean, it's also known as the period of revolutions in the Western world, the French Revolution, the American Revolution. People were really fighting for their rights because they didn't think they were getting Islam might be at the beginning of that now. Um, that started really in the aftermath of um, you know, kind of the Arab Revolution, the Arab Spring, which was not that many years ago. Thank you very much and have a lovely day. Bye.